One thing we have learned in recent times is that not too many people are finding true contentment. We are now in the season of thanks, and however, we're in this season of thanks, but so many people aren't thankful. Haven't you noticed that instead of being thankful, we simply demand things to come our way without being grateful to the one who does provide all of our needs? We have our hands out all the time with the expectation that the Lord should fill them at every whim and every time we utter. The way some believe it is that the more toys you accumulate will make us more thankful. In other words, if we get all the latest gadgets, then we're going to be more grateful. But let me ask you this. If you have all the things of your life that you think would make you happy, would you still really be grateful? I come across these, these stats this week, and despite all of his worldly success and his very vast wealth, Howard Hughes died unrecognizable. His beard, hair, and fingernails and toenails were long, and he was vastly underweight. He supposedly had to be identified at the time of his death by his fingerprints. What's remarkable about this is this guy had all the money in the world to make him happy, but he died a, a pauper. And also, former child star Gary Coleman died broke. Sammy Davis Jr. died $15 million in debt. Judy Garland of the Wizard of Oz fame died $4 million in debt. These folks had everything in life, but they could not handle the responsibilities of wealth and fame. In an article by uh, FinancialSamari.com, they asked this question, how much income do you need to be considered rich? Now, some of you will set up and listen to this. How much do you need to be considered rich? The article says that about income levels, if you make $50,000, you're not rich, but lower middle class. If you make up between $100,000, you're not rich, but you're still middle class. $200,000, you're upper, upper middle class. $350,000, you're still upper middle class. The article says, if you make over $500,000, then you are considered rich. Now, does that make anybody happy this morning? Some of us are falling a little bit short of those, those levels. I'm getting a hint about that. You see, we spend a lifetime of gaining and spending and borrowing. And when it's all said and done, we're still not a whole lot better off. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Answer this question in your heart. What would it take for you to really be happy and for you to really be thankful? Are you enjoying life right now? What would we, what would, uh, what would it take for you just to sit there and simply say, Lord, I am so grateful for everything you brought our way. We are a generation that it just simply are very, very ungrateful. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4.11. He made this statement, and I trust that you would remember this this morning. He says it this way. Not that I speak in respect of want. Look what he says. For I have learned, it's not up on the screen, but here's what he's saying. I have learned whether I'm in prison, whether I'm on a mountaintop, or whether I'm in a valley, I can be, watch this, I can be content. And why could he say that? It's because he had a relationship with Jesus Christ that was strong and was enduring. Now, you already thought I forgot about our text verse. I did not forget about that. So I'm going to ask you, what would it take for you this morning... To be absolutely content and happy in Christ. Now, let me just tell you this. Everyone in this room should be grateful. Should be. Everyone in this room ought to be thankful to the Lord. There's one man in the Bible that probably exemplifies what I want to share with you this morning. And he's in Luke chapter 16. Would you stand with me as we look at this passage? Luke chapter 16, go ahead brother Chris if you would. Luke chapter 16, and if you will, follow along in your Bibles or on the screen this morning, and uh, hopefully that you'll mark these passages well. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, 
which was laid at his gate, look what it says, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Look what it says. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, everybody look up here just before we pray. Just before we pray. If you're in this situation, are you grateful? Let's be honest. If you're in this guy's situation, are you grateful? I'm going to show you something about what this guy had and what many of you or some of you or a few of you in this room may not have and how he was more grateful than us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that we'll invest in your kingdom and your word. Father, I am deeply honored and thrilled for these that came this morning. Lord, just to learn more about you. Father, I pray that the things that we will see this morning will be upon our minds and our hearts for a very long time. And for these in here, Lord, this morning that need this message, I pray, God, there be no distractions. I pray that uh, the Word of God would have free course. And I pray, pray, Lord, that our minds and hearts will be open to the engrafted Word. And, Lord, that we would respond as you see fit. Again, Lord, we are very grateful to be here in your place. But, Father, I pray that you give me liberty to say those things that need to be said. Push those things out of my mind that don't need to be there. I pray that you cleanse me from self and sin. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today, we will paint a picture of a man who was on the outside. It seemed like he did not have much to be thankful for. This man's name was Lazarus, and his name literally means, write this down in your notes or in the margin of your Bible, Lazarus' name really means God hath helped. His name means God hath helped. We are left to wonder what misfortune met this man for him to wind up at the gate of this rich man's home. We know that he was a beggar. We also know that he was sick. Get in your minds that uh, this very condition of this man that we are con- uh, that we're discussing. He was very poor. We learned that he could not take care of himself. We learned that his body was full of sores and the mangy dogs came to lick his wounds. Now, when we see the word dogs in that t- passage, we think of some kind of lap dog, but that's not what they were. These were wild dogs. These were dogs looking for food. And these were dogs that was out, uh, would do anything just to get a scrap, just like Lazarus. So this was not no blessing to him necessarily, but these dogs were there, the Bible says, to lick him. Now, we also learn that these sores that covered his body are referred to some kind of wound or some kind of ulcers. These sores were visible, and in many cases, painful. Consider the only relief he had was when these dogs came to lick him. There was no other relief that this guy had. In this story, we learned that uh, anyone, that no one really cared for this sick and dying man. He had no one to bind up his wounds. He had no one to get him a bite of food. He was totally out on his own. All he wanted and needed was a little compassion. Now think of the many that walked by him day by day with little regards for this man. This rich man living in this huge mansion did not care one thing about Lazarus or his condition. He would not even spare him a little portion of food. Now I want to break from this story and I want to beg your indulgence just for this just for a moment. Now I want you to consider something. We learned just now that this, that this particular man was laid at the, at the gate of this particular very wealthy individual. The Bible says that these wounds that he had were visible wounds. Now, I, wanna, I, want, you to, I want you to tune, tune with me on this. I think today in churches all over America, we have a lot of people with wounds, but they're on inside wounds. We have people that are hurting on the inside that no one will ever see. You see, where, where, where we can identify with this man or kind of get a picture of this man, what he was going through and how awful his body must have looked. But the Bible just describes that he was full of sores. So I just want to tell you this. He was probably not much to look at. You would not go by this man and just think that uh, everything was all right. As a matter of fact, I would imagine during that particular time period, if you saw him, you would deliberately go out of your way not to even be in contact with him. Is somebody still following me this morning? Now, I want you to understand this. If our wounds were visible to everybody in this room, come on. If our wounds were visible to everybody in this room, 
would people walk by you? If everybody could see the inside that you know that you are, if everybody could see the real you, would you have any friends in this room? Would people be repulsed by your life as they were by Lazarus' life? See, that's an interesting situation because I want to tell you, we are all in the same boat as, as, as Lazarus was. Now, follow me with this. The rich man in this story had more than, than, he, than, than enough. Look at verse number 21, and we'll, we'll try to speed up. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. In other words, just give me a scrap of food. This poor man would scream out, all I need is just a little bit. If anyone in life was not treated fairly, it was Lazarus. All he wanted was a bite of real food, yet no one stopped to assist him or care for his daily needs. Even in the story of the Good Samaritan. Somebody, do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Look, if you will, at this story in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 33. Look at the correlation what happened here. At least somebody had compassion. Now watch what it says. But a certain Samaritan, don't even know who it was, as he journeyed came where he was. And when he saw him, look at this, circle that word. He had compassion. Now watch this. He had compassion on him and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in the oil and the wine, and set him on his beast and brought him to an end. And look at this part. Look at this. And took care of him. Now what's the difference in the in, in this story of the Good Samaritan and this guy by the name of Lazarus. In the story of the Good Samaritan, at least somebody had compassion and cared for him. Amen. Somebody at least went out of their way. Somebody spent a little bit on this on this beat up, uh, bleeding man. But in this story of Lazarus, nobody cared. Nobody offered to lend a hand. Nobody says that I will give you just a little bit of food. Now, can I can I tell you this? Watch this. Everybody in this room lives an abundant life. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, preacher. You just... Now, okay, let, let me back up and let me tell you this. God has been good to you, and I want to tell you this. If, if you're sitting at that rich man's gate, and if you're there, and no one cared for you, what would, you, what would go through your mind? Poor old Lazarus had nobody, absolutely nobody, just to get him a scrap of food. I'm telling you, in this generation, we are a very selfish generation. We're going to cling to what's ours, what's, our, what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine, and don't ask me for anything else. You see, we, are, we have grown more selfish, more selfish and self-centered as the day goes by. Let me just tell you this here at the church listen every christian ought to be generous every christian ought to be generous why it's because god has been generous to you listen i want to tell you this morning how do i know that you had a good week how do i know that god's been special to you it's because you are here and because god has done a work in your life and he sustained you he's gotten you here and listen some of you gotten here maybe it's a bit a, by difficulty, I don't know, but you're here because God wanted you to understand this. He's been good to you. And let me ask you this. Have you been good to Him? Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. How many times this last week have you had an opportunity to help somebody in need? How many times this last week that you could have gone out of your way to make sure someone else's life was a little bit more comfortable. How many times could you have knocked on someone's door, sent a card, made a phone call, or just provided a financial need, a meal to somebody that was hungry? Maybe they don't look like you. Maybe they don't even smell like you. Maybe their, their condition in life is something that you wouldn't even condone. But I can tell you this, we as God's people are to be the salt and the light of the world. And friend, if we're not going to do it, may I ask you, who is? Let's pull back the layer just a minute and go behind the scenes and take a look-see of what was really happening. Lazarus was desperately ill and found a gate of the rich man and, 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 and stayed there. While he had no strength, he could, he could at least call out, possibly to the rich man himself for help. And I just want to know if this, 
Can you hear this, this, this weak voice Lazarus call out to those that were walking by and just simply ask somebody, could you give me some food? I'm hungry. Could you, could you give me any scrap? Anything will do. May I suggest to you, friend, that's a condition of a lost sinner right there. That's a condition of somebody that is dying without hope. But can I tell you this? We have all been there in our lives some form or fashion. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you've never had a personal relationship with God. And can I tell you this? Before this story is out and before this message is out, I'm going to tell you this. Everybody in this room needs a relationship with Christ because I want to tell you this. This story is a very, very good picture of us before we came to Christ. Friend, can I tell you this? We've all sat at the gate. We've all been beggars. We've all been wanting. And we've all wondered somewhere in our life, does anybody really care for us? There may be somebody in this room that had a, has had a very difficult week and you've asked yourself, you've even asked your family, does anyone even care for us anymore? Nobody comes sees us. Nobody even calls us. Nobody even concerns themselves with us. Does anybody ever care for us? I wonder what Lazarus thought. As he was sitting at that gate and... Now watch this, watch this. Don't miss it. Watch this. As he could turn his head... And he could look at this great big mansion on the back side. And he knew what went on in there. There would be lavish parties and there would be laughter and there would be abundance. But yet he stayed there at this gate and no one, which, whoo, whoo, watch, no one provided one single thing. Are we awake? Come on, come on. No one. When people walk by, oh Lazarus, I wonder if this, I wonder if, Eyes of compassion or eyes of pity. I wonder if he would just look at you and say, would at least you help me? Could you do something for me? Could you at least just give me a scrap of bread, just a drink of water, just something to meet my physical needs? People could see, watch, people could see that he was dying. People could see that he was sick. People could see that he had a need that they needed to fulfill because he couldn't do anything. Back there, there was no social programs. The only social programs was you and I to walk by and try to assist this individual. There was nobody back then. Friend, can I tell you this? I'm just thinking that this is a great big world in which we live in, but I still believe there are people that feel just like old Lazarus feels. I still believe there are people in the world that just wonder if there's somebody that would just reach out to them and care. If somebody in Mule Shoot, Texas would knock on that door, make that phone call, invite that person to church just to let them know that, yeah, they're still here and that somebody cares for their souls. I've often wondered this, and I think you have too, I wonder as the party and the people would go in and out of that gate and they'd see old Lazarus. I wonder, watch, 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 don't miss it, don't miss it. I wonder if Lazarus would say something to them about the Lord. I don't know. I just wonder if, if he just knew the Lord or if, if, if he would just try to witness to those individuals because here's what we understand in this story. Lazarus did not have anything physically. Oh, but beloved, he had something spiritually that none of those people had. And I just wonder, in eyes of compassion, in eyes of pity, maybe, watch, 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 wait a minute, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, everybody watch. Maybe, maybe, Lazarus is not the bad guy in this story after all. Maybe Lazarus is not the really poor guy in this story after all. Maybe he has something that no one else in that story ever had. Maybe those people in that house and that fancy belongings and all of their stuff and all of their TVs and all of their Walmart gift cards and all of their stuff that they had. Maybe, 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 maybe Lazarus wasn't the bad guy after all. I've just always concerned myself and thought about this story time and time again. When he saw these people coming by, I wonder if he would say, God bless you. God bless you. Jesus loves you. Come on, come on. That's what made the situation so much worse. Is because not only did they reject what come on, come on. Not only did they reject him, they rejected the God that he served. Wow. So we see this picture painted very clearly. Something that Lazarus knew, but something that Jesus said puts this all in perspective. 
Can you bump up to Luke chapter 16 and verse number 14? And I want to show you something that ought to concern everyone in this room. If you have a highlighter or a pen, may I suggest that you underscore something very quickly in your Bibles? Watch, watch this. Jesus is telling this story, and he's telling it to these religious leaders. And, and, and notice what he says. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things. And they derided him, or made fun of him. And he said unto them, watch, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Here's where you need to underscore in your Bible. But God knoweth your hearts. Wow, wow. Maybe the deeper meaning in this story is the fact that this man's hearts have grown cold and hard and uncaring. There are some things that we believe are more important in caring for our own brothers and sisters. We all would do better in lending a helping hand or simply to be there to listen for those who are hurting. Lazarus needed help, but no one came. But let me give you this. Would you have been willing to help this poor man with all those sores and those ulcers? And what about the smell that ultimately he must have had? This man, listen, this man begged for crumbs. All he wanted was love. All he wanted was somebody to reach out to him. And I wonder if he felt like the psalmist in Psalm chapter 142 and verse number 4. Here I wonder if, if, if Lazarus felt like this. I looked on my right hand and behold, but there was no man that would know me. Look at this. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. But something is fixing to change for Lazarus. And bless God, it did change in a hurry. You know that life has a way of not staying the same. If I look up here, you know that. Life has a way of moving on. Life has a way of, 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 of going down the highway pretty quickly. And can I tell you this? Lazarus was starving to death. And his body was getting weaker by the day. Look at Luke chapter 16 and verse number 22. And it came to pass. Uh-oh. That the beggar died. My Bible says he was carried by the angels. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you don't get anything else, get this. Isn't that comfort to a saint? Did anybody get that? He was carried by the angels. I just have a belief that when you as a saint of God die, you don't go by yourself. I believe there are some angels that escort you to your heavenly home. Amen. Look what it says. And he was carried by the angels. I love that. It's Abraham's bosom. But now look at the contrast. The rich man died also and was buried. Lazarus died and was immediately in heaven or Abraham's bosom, as the Bible describes it. Now we see another person who died. This rich man had all the resources of life. People wanted him. He had wealth. He had power. And he had prestige. His money could buy him favors and friends, but it could not buy him his salvation. After Lazarus died, he had a homecoming fit for kings. Could somebody at least amen that? He was in paradise in the company of Abraham in the presence of Old Testament saints. We also learned that a group of angels came to escort him home. And can I tell you, can you imagine the sights and sounds that Lazarus experienced that first day he glimpsed in glory? Amen. Now watch this, watch this. Everybody watch this. Woo! Are you with me? I wish Jonathan was here to hear that. Uh, can you imagine every day he stayed at that rich man's gate and he looked and he saw all the opulence. He saw all of the rich. He saw all of the finery that man can build. Yet, the situation now turns. You know what happens? Now, oh Lazarus is way up here in Abraham's bosom. And he has everything that man could ever want. Now he is comforted. Now guess, watch this. Now guess who's the rich man. You ever thought about that? Now who's got it all? Oh, but can I tell you this? He knew, I believe Lazarus kind of knew what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9 says. I believe he had a concept of this. But as it is written, which means it's already been stated before, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. Underscore this, the things, plural, many things, which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Amen. Now listen, keep that a minute, Brother Chris. 
I don't know what that word thieves all encompasses, but here's what I do understand as, as a preacher of the gospel. I desire to have whatever those things are. Amen. I desire one day to be able to witness those things. I'd be able one day to understand that because I've loved God and because I accepted Him and because I believed on Him for eternal life, that one day, my friend, He's going to give me those things which God has prepared for them that love him. What will that be? My friend, it's hard to put it in imagine it's hard to put it into words. All I know, it's going to be great. I also believe that old Lazarus knew something about Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 4. I believe he had an understanding of this as well. Notice what your Bible says. And God shall, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, praise the Lord, neither sorrow, look at this, nor crying, neither shall there be any more, what's that word? Do you think maybe Lazarus understood what pain was? Yeah, look what it says, there'll be no more of that, here's, 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 here, here it is, for the former things, what's it say? <laughs> or away. You know what old Lazarus is doing now? His body is not full of those sores. There's no dogs licking his wounds in heaven. There's no tears forming in his eyes no more. He's no more begging for somebody to have compassion because he's at a place that finally loves him and recognizes him who he is. He is now a son of the living God. He is at home, home at last. And I honestly, some of you don't believe this. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I don't care. I know what people say. This is a parable. I get that. I just don't believe it's a parable. I believe it's a real story. And I believe one day we're going to see old Lazarus in glory. One day we're going to see, what was it all about, Lazarus? Was it worth it? He's going to say, yes, because there was a day that somebody told me about a man made Jesus. I didn't understand it all the time. My body would not let me cooperate. And I did not get healed down on earth. But here's one thing I knew. That Jesus Christ was my Redeemer. And I trusted Him for my salvation. And oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Glory, 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 hallelujah. I believe old Lazarus knows the redemption story. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Here we see, no longer trapped in that old diseased and no longer trapped in a body that would not cooperate with him. So grateful for that. But there was another man in a story. He is the one who had everything on earth. He worshipped his money and status and focus on his cash and not Christ. I mean, somehow he believed that if he had a big enough bank account, he could be fine. But that is far different with what the Bible says. And after this rich man died, listen to this. Here's a personal opinion. Here's a personal opinion. Okay, let me get down here. Here's a personal opinion. Watch, watch, watch. After he died, I believe his five brothers, come on, they came and got his body. They took the rich man and they buried him. They put him in the finest tomb that money could buy. And then as soon as this guy was buried, here's what they did. They went back to that rich man's house and started looking for the wheel. Well, I wonder what he left me. I wonder what kind of stuff I got now. And they were rummaging through his papers and said, man, 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 where's that wheel? Listen, I just believe that kind of stuff happens. You know, how, you know why I believe that? Because it still happens today. And we have not improved the gene pool since that time right there, I can tell you. Now listen. They were rummaging through all this. We understand he had all these five brothers. They were just in it for what they could get out of it. But in Luke chapter 16, verse number 23, the story changes Grass drastically. The Bible says, talking about this former rich man, being in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. Uh-oh. Now, wait a minute. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. When the rich man was on earth, we are, even, we are never even told that he even noticed Lazarus. Now, all of a sudden, he sees him. I wonder why now. Keep with me here. And Lazarus, he sees old Lazarus. Pain now fills his soul, not Lazarus. In his torment, he saw two people. One was Lazarus, the former beggar, and he sees a man by the name of Abraham that he heard about all of his life. Now this former rich man knew that the Bible was correct. 
I know you Bible readers have always seen this. And I get that. And I know everybody in this room knows what I'm fixing to show you. I get that. But just suppose there's one person in this room has never seen this. I want you to look at verse number 24 of Luke chapter 16. Look at verse number 24. Oh, how things change. Look what your Bible says. I want to show you this. And I want you to catch your phrase. In verse number 24, it says this. And he cried and said, now watch this, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now he takes up the practice of praying before he never gave it one thought. Did anybody catch that? Now let's consider something. Who is the beggar now? You see, this former rich man did not love God. Now the day many believe would never come did come. He says these words, this former rich man, this man that had everything on earth, he says, for I am tormented in this flame. Lazarus is comforted, and this former rich man is in agony. Now please let that soak in just a minute. This, now watch this. This rich man did not go to hell because he was rich, and Lazarus did not go to heaven because he was poor. The only way for you to end up in glory with your resurrected Savior is to place your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection for His blood to wipe away your sins. Amen? Lazarus believed in Jesus for salvation, and the former rich man did not. Look at verse number 25. And I want to show you something. If you've got a pen, be ready for this. Look at verse number 25. But Abraham son, said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Underscore the word remember there in that verse. Oh, what a word that is. That word remember means to recollect, recollect or to bear in mind. All those wasted years of times you cursed the Lord's name. All the times you rejected the message of the cross. All the times you thought the preacher was wasting your time. It will now come back to haunt you. You see, the rich man prayed, but it was too late. He knew nothing of prayer down on earth. Praying to one of the saints is useless. Listen, don't miss this. Who is he praying to now? He says, Father Abraham. Let, let me just tell you this. If there is no other doctrine in the Bible you need to pay attention to, it's this one. There is one denomination believes you can pray to the saints. How good did that do him? Father Abraham have mercy on me. Friend, listen, your prayers to the saints ain't going to get you to heaven. It, listen, it is your prayer to the shed blood of Jesus that's going to get you to heaven, not to the saints. Can somebody amen that? I want you to understand that. He prayed to the saint, but he did not pray to the Savior. Oh, friend, what a condition he had. Now, very quickly, verse number 26, and we're nearly done. And besides all this, wow, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Watch. So they which would pass from thence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Notice the word gulf. And guys, would you stay awake for this? And I pray that you'll never, ever forget what I'm fixing to share with you. Are you ready? The word gulf in this passage gives us our word chasm. C-H-A-S-M. It is a medical word that literally means an opened wound. That explains it. Between those in heaven and in hell is an open wound. What keeps a lost person in hell, my friend, is an open wound. The wounds of our dear Savior. Those wounds that was in His sides, His hand, and His head. God sees those wounds and His wrath burns. What keeps a saved person in heaven is that open wound that pleads the blood of Jesus Christ to cancel God's wrath. You see, the former rich man did not care about preachers or the Word, but God still does. Can I tell you, what keeps you in hell is none other than than the fact that when God looks at that chasm, when God looks at that wound, He remembers that you rejected the Word of God and His Son forever. And my friend, the wrath of God will burn on you forever and ever and ever and ever. Luke chapter 16, verse 27 and 28. Then He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend into my Father's house. Look at this. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. Look what this guy says. 
lest thou come into this place of torment. May I direct your attention to a couple of words and then we're done. In verse number 23, would you get your pen and underscore the word torments? Verse number 24, the word tormented. Verse number 25, the word tormented. And verse number 28, the place of torment. All of these words mean torture and sorrow. Why would the Lord make sure all of these same words were in this passage? My beloved, He's trying to warn us to tell you that this indeed is a horrible place and it's not for mankind. Can I share with you one other thing before we're done? Would you, would you at least give me this? How bad can it really be? Preach, I just, I just don't know, all right? Let me show you something. Look at Mark chapter 9 and let me show you these verses right quick before we end. Mark chapter 9 and look at verse number 43. Notice what your Bible says this morning. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Look what it says. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot shall offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life having two feet or to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. For the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter to the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not. Over and over it says, and the fire is not quenched. My friend, those are sobering verses. We are warned against this place, and words cannot describe how terrifying and the constant pains and screams and flames and the devilish creatures that will be there to make your life a constant nightmare. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 13 says it this way, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now watch this. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, watch this, my Bible says, was cast in to the lake of fire. No one who is ever in hell will be able to say to God, you put me here, and no one who is in heaven will ever be able to say, I put myself there. My friend, it is totally a work of Almighty God. And this is for me to you. Words cannot describe the place of torment. The Bible says over and over in these passages, torments, tormented, tormented, place of torment. And here's what we do as Americans. We listen to that, and I know, I know, here's what it goes. It goes right over our heads. Because here's what we believe. We don't simply believe a God would ever do that. We don't simply believe a God will ever separate us to a place like that because we've lived to believe that all the TV shows we've watched and all of the horrors we see in the world, that that is hell enough. The Bible paints a, a, a broader picture than that, my friend. He paints a picture like this. If you decide to reject Him as your personal Savior, man Women, boys, or girls, you will pay the ultimate punishment for that. And here's what I know. You will not stand before that great white throne judgment and point your finger at God and say, why didn't you ever tell me? Because here's what I believe. Come on, Miss Dana. Here's what I believe. I believe that before you go to hell, you will have an opportunity to have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. How do I believe this? It's because I believe Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, even the very nature of God declares His handiwork. When you walk out of your front door, I believe you can see the power and the magnificence of God Almighty. Now listen to me, listen to me as we close. Preacher, why are you preaching this? And what, what, what's the big deal about it? Here's the big deal about it. It's because I simply believe in every service and in every church in America, there are those people that are lost and they need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There is somebody in this room, and I don't know who it is, there's somebody in this room that has never trusted on Jesus for their Savior, and it may be you. You, 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 you could sit there and say, Preacher, you, this just don't even phase me anymore. Okay, it don't phase you, but let me just give you this last line of thought. If you walk out of here without a relationship with Jesus Christ, my friend, you are forever going to remember this Sunday of Muleshoe, Texas in this uh, November Sunday. Here, here, here. Why? Because the Bible says, remember. 
I believe there are people screaming in the pits of hell today because they remembered the opportunities they could have had if they would have just asked Jesus as their Savior. Some of you, some of you could have asked Jesus Christ as their Savior on this November Sunday. For some reason or another, you, you allowed the devil to tell you, you're okay. Just put it off. Let's just do this some other time. There is no other time for your redemption than when God is dealing with your heart right now. 